and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Georgina and this is Art History Girl. Thanks so much for joining us because today we have got one of the most exciting videos for you ever. This is going to be all about the Lewis Chessmen and I've loved researching it so I really hope you enjoy the video. The Lewis Chessmen are a group of 12th century chess pieces which were found on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. That's Scotland in case you didn't know. These were made by Vikings during the Romanesque period, and the craftsmanship is incredible. They're perfectly formed miniature sculptures. They also show all kinds of human emotion. There's power, beauty and fear. They're a really important part of history and they're an amazing discovery, because whereas lots of sculptures from around this time have been worn away by weather or damaged for whatever reason, these miniature soldiers have been perfectly preserved throughout nearly a thousand years and they're by far the biggest collection of chess pieces that have ever been discovered from this period so they're very important because they tell us about the viking world the chess pieces almost definitely date from after 1150 and we know this because of the way the bishop is wearing his hat or mitre as it's known by 1150, it was standard practice to wear a mitre pointing towards the front of the head. Before then, the fashion was to wear them from side to side. And all of the Lewis bishops, and there are 16 in total, are wearing their mitres in this new fashion. When they were first found, it was assumed they were made on the Isle of Lewis. But it's thought the chessmen were probably made in Trondheim instead. Trondheim was the medieval capital of Norway in the 12th century. And this also makes perfect sense because during that period, the Isle of Lewis, along with other major groups of Scottish islands, were ruled by Norway. Some Icelandic scholars have claimed that they were carved at Skaholt in Iceland instead, and that's because there was a very skilled carver, Margaret the Andra, the high status wife of a priest, and she was known as the most skilled carver in Iceland. And she was regularly commissioned by the Bishop Pal to craft walrus ivory gifts, which were sent to friends in high up places overseas. But most scholars think that they were made in Trondheim by a workshop of craftsmen because the pieces are all different shapes and sizes. According to Alex Wolfe, who's a senior lecturer in medieval studies at St Andrews University, there are a few reasons for believing the chess pieces came from Trondheim. To begin with, Trondheim was a very rich place and it would have made sense that these were made here because wealthy people would have been able to pay craftsmen for these high quality chess pieces and they're really so intricate and detailed, they're real works of art. Another reason for thinking that they came from Trondheim is that there's a similar carving in Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim and that would date from around the same time, so it seems likely that that's an option. A kite-shaped shield was also found in an excavation in Trondheim, and it's very similar to some of the shields which are found on the pieces. And Wolf, the scholar who I mentioned before, has said the armour worn by the chess figures includes perfect reproductions of armour worn at the time in Norway. So yes, there's lots of indications that they were probably made in Trondheim. Almost all of the collection are made from walrus ivory, but quite a few of them were made from whale teeth instead. The northwestern area of Norway was the centre of the walrus ivory trade in the 12th century, and it would have been a really valuable material because it came from Greenland, where walruses were hunted in the summer, and the conditions would have been really hazardous, so the tusk would have been very expensive. It would have travelled hundreds of miles, passing through lots of hands, and they wouldn't have wasted a scrap. But these miniature sculptures were not just made to be looked at, they're also functional chess pieces, and they've been designed really well. All of the pieces have a low centre of gravity, so that they wouldn't be knocked over easily as they cross a chessboard. They're also really compact and don't have any protruding parts. This means they're much less likely to be damaged. None of the pieces have necks, they all have hunched shoulders, and that makes them a lot more solid. The crooks on the bishops also don't protrude in any way, they're close to the body, and the swords on the king's laps are attached as well. Chess was invented as an Indian war game in 600 AD, and the rules have stayed largely the same since it was first invented. 
but the design of the pieces themselves underwent a radical transformation when they entered Europe, and they reflect the Scandinavian world. Whereas in the Eastern world, chess pieces were usually divided into different army regiments, the Lewis chessmen are significant because they're the earliest human-shaped chess pieces. How crazy is that? This chess piece is thought to be Southern Italian, and it's about 100 years older than the Lewis chessmen. And what you see here is a hybrid between the old-fashioned Eastern style and the modern version. It's got an elephant cavalry with humans riding on top of them. The Lewis Chessmen is also the first game where we see bishops being introduced into the game. Bishops became a feature of Scandinavian life around 1000 AD because the Vikings were put in touch with Christianity through their raids. As a result, bishops were becoming an increasingly important part of their lives and they were given almost as much power as kings in some cases. What you've got represented here is three orders of 12th century Viking society. You've got the ones who rule, the ones who pray, and the ones who work. The pawns are also represented as non-human forms, and that's often how we see them today. This is probably not an accident either. They would have used peasants as their foot soldiers, and this decision not to show the pawns as humans reflects how the ruling elite would have seen them. Another huge thing that is depicted here is the queen. It's not the first depiction of a queen in a board game, but it shows the important role the queen played during this time. They were very visible and often quite powerful. Eleanor of Aquitaine ruled large parts of France in the 12th century, so that would have been during this time. All of the queens are resting their heads in their hands, and while they look maybe a bit sad or even bored to us, it's thought this pose is meant to show contemplation, repose, and possibly wisdom. Rather appropriate for a game of chess, perhaps, but it's also thought they were depicted similarly to the Virgin Mary. During this time, she was shown often with her head in her hands. And not only was the Virgin considered a very virtuous symbol, but she's also shown throughout the ages mourning her son, because obviously he ends up being crucified. And with the Viking conquests, battles, and raids very common during this time, the chief mourners in society were principally women who'd lost their husbands, so this is quite likely a reflection of that. Norway was undoubtedly converting to Christianity, but these changes happen over time, and the Lewis chessmen show figures from Norse pagan roots as well. Four of the rooks are shown as wild-eyed berserkers, biting their shields with battle fury. And this madness was considered a perfect quality of pagan warriors. According to a 13th century account, these men wore no armour and were as mad as dogs or wolves, bit their shields, were as strong as bears or bulls. They killed other men, but neither fire nor iron could kill them. These angry men seem quite funny to our modern eyes, but we actually get the modern word berserk from these characters. Chess was a game mostly played by kings and queens, but playing chess was quite socially aspirational. There were seven skills that knights were meant to master during the Middle Ages, and chess was one of them. The clergy also adopted the game as a suitable pastime, and this was presumably because they saw themselves in the pieces. There were eight kings found in the Lewis Horde, and it's thought the discovery unearthed four chess sets, because eight kings, there's two in each game, makes sense. No one knows where the Lewis chessmen were meant to end up or who they were for. Because there are enough chess pieces for four boards, it's thought the sets would have been commissioned as a bulk order, or that they were the stock of a dealer. A queen was found in a bog in County Meath in Ireland, so historians believe that the Lewis chessmen were on a journey, possibly from Norway to Ireland, where there was a large Norse presence. It's unknown exactly the date they were discovered, but they were first exhibited in Edinburgh in 1831, and most accounts say the pieces were found at Uig Bay on the west coast of Lewis in a sand dune. One account is that Malcolm MacLeod, a local from a nearby town of Penny Donald, found them in a small stone chest in a sand dune. Another story suggests it was a cow that actually disturbed the hoard, but this is generally thought to be made up, or at least a bit of an embellishment of the truth. Whatever happened, it was definitely an accidental discovery. The discipline of archaeology was in its very early stages, 
and they were probably buried in a secure container because they're so well preserved. And they were so well preserved that Sir Madden from the British Museum actually described some of them as almost the colour of beetroot when they were first found. But that clearly has faded so drastically that most of the ones now in museums are all ivory coloured. It was Madden, the assistant keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum, who persuaded the trustees to buy 82 chess pieces for 80 guineas. Madden was a paleographer, so he studied ancient manuscripts, but he was especially interested in the Lewis Hoard because he loved playing chess, and he was a huge chess enthusiast himself. But the museum was duped into believing they'd bought the full collection from an Edinburgh-based dealer called Mr Forrest, when in actual fact Mr Forrest had divided the hoard and sold the 11 remaining pieces to the National Museum of Scotland. There's a lot of controversy around whether they should be in the British Museum or whether they should be brought back to Scotland. The Lewis Chessmen have risen to prominence in recent years because they're the chess set used in Harry Potter, or at least they're the chess set that the film is based on. Knight to E5. Queen to E5. That's totally barbaric. That's wizard's chess. And also last year in 2019, another piece which was part of the set was bought by an anonymous buyer for £735,000. And that's crazy because it had been originally bought by a man in Edinburgh for £5 in 1964 because he didn't know it was part of the Lewis Hoard. So that's quite a profit. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to subscribe and like if you enjoyed it and there'll be lots more coming over the next few weeks. I am not 100% sure what's coming up, but it probably won't be European paintings because I'm trying to be as diverse as possible. And there's so much in art that's really interesting. People really overlook the decorative arts, sculpture, architecture, clothes even, fashion. So yes, please stay tuned and join us for the next video. Thank you, bye.